thanks for having me here today at Strange Loop. It's my first Strange Loop conference, having a good time. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about Spotify's personalization audio platform uh, and specifically the role structure. Sorry, is this going in and out too? All good? Okay. Um, and the role of infrastructure that, that plays in. So my name is Josh Baer. I lead product for our machine learning platform that we've just renamed as the Hendrix platform. This talk isn't about that. Uh, probably a series of blog posts maybe later in the year or next year uh, if we get around to it. But essentially, it's a product portfolio uh, that, that we, we use for our machine that our machine learning practitioners use. Um, I talk, okay. Yeah, I wanted to give you that context around Hendrix because the little H in this slide, uh, it'll keep coming up and that's what it means. I got some feedback when I was doing a dry run with my team that it was confusing, so just set that context. At Spotify for the last 10 years, uh, all coming up on 10 years, uh, I started out as an engineer building out our data platform, uh, then I transitioned into product a few years, uh, a few years after that. Uh, for the last four years, I've been building out our machine learning platform. So what I'm going to talk to you today deals with personalization. Personalization is all over Spotify, from the shelves you see at home to the playlists that you listen to, to the messages that you receive when you first start joining Spotify. Uh, and even the offers when your band, your favorite band is in town. That's all driven by ML2. But I'm going to focus on the recommendation aspect probably because that's the aspect that's most familiar to you as a Spotify user. And since this is the Strange Loop conference, I'm going to be focusing particularly about the loops within the recommendation process, loops that we call learning loops. So my role at Spotify is to try to ensure that we maximize the amount of these learning loops every year, particularly in the ML space. I'll talk a little bit about my, how my team does that at Spotify, and I'll talk about some of the challenges uh, we've encountered on the way to where we are. So first, some background information on Spotify. So when I first started doing talks in the US uh, 2013 about Spotify, not a lot of people used it. But I'm curious, like, how many folks in this audience uh, are users of Spotify? Wow. Yeah, no, no, uh, no hate if you're not. Totally understandable. Uh, but it's totally changed over time. Uh, but just for a little context, we have about 80 million tracks on our platform. We have 4 million podcasts. We have 400 million plus users in over 180 territories. Uh, and if you're a super Spotify fan, you might have seen that this week that we just launched audiobooks. So that's like our third format that we've been playing around with. And our ML usage, to set some context, um, we have over 80 teams that are doing ML in some capacity. We have about 400,000 pipeline runs uh, per year. We have about 50 that are produced, 50,000 pipeline runs. And we, our model serving architecture serves about 3 million predictions per second. But first, so my topic is recommendations. Uh, I'll eventually start to get a little bit technical, though by being a product by trade, I wanted to paint a meaningful picture for you all before I get into that recommendation aspect. So when I was in my mid-teens, I had a job working at the Baltimore County Parks Department. Uh, it was a perfect job for a teenager. I had a bit of hard work to do when I started my job, uh, but then it was mostly sitting around doing nothing until the game ended or the park had to close, and, and I had to do a little bit of work. This is very strange. Am I doing something different with the mic? OK. All right. Um, yeah, uh, during the times of doing nothing, I mostly listen to music and lots of music. So every month, I paycheck, then I'd head to the nearest tape store uh, and can come home with music. You correlated strongly with what I liked and heard from the radio. That didn't work out so well. I learned pretty quickly that your ability to put out one hit on the radio didn't necessarily correlate with your ability to produce a good album. Uh, it also meant that my knowledge of music was pretty limited, uh, mostly to what was popular on the radio. But over time, I developed, uh, I did this over time, and, and I started to develop a relationship with the people that worked at the tape store. And they noticed the type of music I, I bought, they noticed the type of music I listened to, 
And they start to recommend me uh, things based off my preferences. I even got to know one of the, the people that worked at the store so well that we he would lend me his old tapes, uh, his live Grateful Dead tapes uh, from, from the 70s and 80s. Uh, and some of the tapes that he lent me were total duds, not at all what I liked, but some of the tapes that he lent me were great, and I'd go you know, buy a, a version of my own. Um, and eventually this relationship grew, and his recommendations got better as he, he got a better idea of my style of music. So maybe you in this audience have similar experience, maybe it was with records, maybe with CDs, maybe MP3s, uh, but you might have an idea of how this process works. And if you understand how that recommendation loops, you've basically understood how our Spotify uh, recommendation work. Except instead of one user and one clerk, one expert system uh, to determine those recommendations, we have data from our hundreds of millions of users looking over our hundred of millions of, of content uh, to recommend the, basic, the best music tracks, albums, and more. Okay, so let's get started walking through the journey of music recommendations at Spotify. So our app started out pretty simply looking, yet the offering was pretty monu monumental. The idea that almost any song or artist that you could think of was just a click away from instant playback. This was in the era of LimeWire and Torrent, remember, uh, where if you use those things, it would often take minutes or hours to get the content that you wanted. Uh, and sometimes you'd end up downloading something and it wasn't at all what you were expecting. The Spotify experience felt magical. And even better, it was legal. Uh, the labels had actually signed off on it. Uh, but anyway, the initial experience was very basic. You could search, you could see top lists, you could create your own playlists. Nothing here was personalized, though. But what was done is that the events were instrumented. And what do I mean by instrumented? So this is more or less what the app did at the time. You, op you open the app, it served you pages, uh, like your library or what's new. You clicked whatever song or album you wanted to play, and we served you that music. But what you might not know, which was one of the most important things from a business perspective, is that we collected these events that are called end songs. Now, end song sounds exactly probably like what it is. It's a multi-fielded event uh, that it gets triggered when a playing song ends, whether it be by skipping a track, picking a new track, uh, closing the app, uh, anything. This event was incredibly important to us. Uh, we could aggregate to know which songs were played the most, and use it to actually play the labels. And of course, we could use this as a basis for our recommendation systems. So we don't just collect end song information, we're collecting all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff about the tracks that you listen to. We're collecting information about the relationships between artists, the tracks, the albums, the, the genres, and more. We're even collecting information that's crawled from the web around reviews and the relationships that they might mention in the reviews. We're even collecting information about the audio itself, the raw audio, and using that to uh, seed some recommendations. And this whole process is actually where I came in. Um, all that information was fed to our Hadoop cluster, which I worked on building out and growing in my early years at Spotify. Once that data was on the cluster, the journey didn't stop there. We had all sorts of job cleaning, doing aggregations, joining different data sets, uh, analyzing usage features and behaviors to see what was run, uh, people were doing with the app, and all that was generating more data on the cluster. And from all those jobs, we could apply all sorts of machine learning algorithms to come up with novel models. Those models would be surfaced in the application to the user. Early. We were heavily into Early on, we were heavily into collaborative filtering models to generate a lot of our personalization. I'm not gonna go into detail in exactly what collaborative filtering in. I'm sure that half the audience here probably could do a better job. Uh, but for some folks, just to give you a basic idea, uh, you take this master, massive matrix representing all our users, 400 million or so, uh, all the tracks, 80 million or so, and you try to fill in missing values based off of what other users might like and you expect this user to listen to. Over time, we added a few more techniques to our products. I can't keep up with all the different techniques that we're applying today. Um, but certainly, we're using a lot of NLP methods, GNNs, et cetera. Um, and I know there's a lot of just interesting stuff going on. 
And over time, this use of ML has led to many advances of the products. Uh, so in 2008, we started to feed those end songs, the relationships with other blogs and stuff, the latest artist features. In uh, 2011 and 2012, we built out the radio feature uh, that was based off a lot of machine learning. 2013, we uh, innovated on this product, uh, which was launched when I started. Uh, really cool. And in 2015, we took that Discover product and we put a playlist around it, uh, creating what was then our Discover Weekly. Uh, I'm going to turn off my phone just in case that happens to be the source of the interference. OK, and now we're at a point when machine learning is virtually everywhere in the application. Here's a screenshot I took a little while back about my own home personalization page. The different colors represent different systems that are all doing machine learning. So we have the orange there that represents these massive ensemble systems, like home and search. We have green that represents different ranking systems. So in the home page, we rank different content, the different shelves that come up for you uh, based off of different models. We have Fuchsia that represents a few personalized playlists. So these are all driven by machine learning, and then there's usually like a, a filter at the end that makes sure that we're recommending you stuff that you haven't listened to, or maybe that all sort of fit a playlist. Um, we have yellow that represents these curated playlists by our expert curators. Uh, they're actually using machine learning in a few different ways. One way is that you might have one of these massive playlists like uh, dinner classical music. And that actually, on our end, might be 500 songs that our curators say is dinner classical music. But we know that serving a playlist of 500 songs isn't very feasible, so we might reduce that down to 60 or so, uh, the more playlist shape. And we do that 60 sort of filtering based off of your own personal taste and your user vector. Uh, also, another way that we use ML is our curators uh, will use machine learning to populate a song. So if you're a curator and you're trying to create some you know, St. Louis conference listening playlist, uh, you might have five or six tracks. You know, probably Nelly's going to be there somehow. Uh, you might seed it with five or six tracks that fit this genre. And then we have machine learning help you recommend other tracks that they can listen to and say, yeah, this is really, really uh, very simple. So machine learning is really all over the place. Now I'm going to zoom in on the personalization and how the machine learning actually factors in. How we build infrastructure to make this process go smooth, maybe. It. And again, since it's the strange loop conference, I'm probably going to be a little bit corny and focus in on those loops there. This is my first conference, so I don't know if that's overdone, so apologies if it is. So in particular, I'm going to talk about these various loops that form that picture on the right. Uh, now, don't worry too much about what the picture is. Uh, I'll go through sort of completing it one by one in these next few slides. So let's start with the basics. How does machine learning start off? The first thing is what I'm called the problem understanding loop. You need to start with a problem to solve. You need to have a metric to measure your progress. And you need to have some existing data to form the basis of a model. You might go through a few iterations of this before you come to a place where you feel comfortable with your baseline problem, metrics and data. It's completely normal to come back to this loop even after you've built something out. It's also completely healthy and expected to come away from this loop with a determination that either you don't have the data you needed to pursue an ML approach, or you don't have a problem that ML can actually really even help out with. The latter issue can lead to a very costly, uh, wasted time and frustrated engineers if not held in check. The form issue, former issue, lack of data, is actually something that can be addressed with another loop. That's the data collection loop. So when collecting data, you might start out super simply, as we did with Spotify, just collecting the end songs that served the foundation of many of our recommendation systems. After you have a baseline for some data to validate the idea, the approach, and the metrics, et cetera, it's time to start thinking about building an ML system. So you create a service that does something. Maybe it generates the smoothest yak rock tracks. Maybe it orders the home page. To keep it simple, we'll just say that it serves, the service returns some sort of prediction. And at this point, we'll actually go ahead and introduce some basic building blocks for where a model fits in there, too, and where data will help out with the system. 
also instrument essentially logging pieces for a loop, collecting what will eventually serve be the features for our eventual model. We'll also have some tooling to collect labels. Here's a zoomed out view of that. The basic idea is that we're serving something based off the model and data, and eventually going to be collecting something representing labels. Now this, of course, is a supervised learning model that I'm talking about. You can envision a simple metric like the click-through or the play rate of songs. This might be used to rank songs in a playlist based off of the likelihood to click or play and eventually score on clicks and plays. And to fill out some more information, at this point we're starting out with heuristics. Okay. A heuristic model is heuristics. Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't like the... Basically a series of if or else then statements, but encapsulated within model architecture. This could be something like a model that just returns the most popular tracks per region based off of aggregations, and we might have done at the region level already. So this is really starting to create the, uh, the foundations for an important learning loop. You can start playing around with your data and model here, and even change the way that your service behaves, ideally to learn and improve it. So now you have the basic structure for machine learning system, even though there's no actual machine learning yet. You can move on to this next learning loop, improving your data. This stage is often the most difficult and time consuming for a lot of our ML practitioners at Spotify. Data is never where you need it, it's never formatted the best way. Uh, it's usually not clean enough to, to do something useful when you first start off with it. So you'll need to fix that, or you'll need to find a data set that's already fixed that. So in this phase, I have data or features uh, in experimentation. That could include cleaning, combining, transforming, etc. Once you have something you like, you'll need to store it for future use. Uh, you'll often come back to this loop as you build out your machine learning system. So plugging this loop in the overall ML systems building process, we see it at the end there, interacting with our data store, feeding into our model. We've taken a lot of our, we've taken a, our plain old popularity and joined it with a table containing demographic information. So now we can provide a slightly more personalized system to our user, even if it's not really an ML system yet. We call this loop development or feature engineering. So now we have some data, we have the skeleton of our ML system, we have a simple heuristic model, but now we want to get more complex. So we might add in another very familiar loop to many in this audience, the model training loop. This is where machine learning comes in. So we have a number of things to do here. We need to do the model selection and move forward with some model architecture that fits the shape of a problem. We need to do the training. Uh, we need to do some evaluations of the model based off of maybe those metrics that we identified earlier um, and maybe some model specific ones that we've added on. So we'll almost never get everything right the first time. Uh, so we'll be stuck in this loop for quite a while, tweaking our data, tweaking our model code, analysis code, et cetera. I've, people, I've seen people at Spotify spend weeks or months at this phase exploring different frameworks and different model architectures and analyzing the results in different ways that come up with something that hopefully proves our original hypothesis. And back to our overall system, it sort of looks like this. I've added a few other things that I didn't quite mention. Um, since this is a system we've deployed as a, a part of a Spotify service, so it's actually sort of feeding music in the, or re interacting with the app, um, I might call that an online service. Now, I've different flow between the online and the offline data. Uh, you can think of offline here being at data as REST, on GCS, S3, et cetera, and online being at a performant data store uh, like Bigtable or DynamoDB, something simple. Uh, similar. This, like many of my slides, drastically oversimplifies the process, but the basic idea is that you try to keep the data and the transformations that you're doing the same, right? both offline and online. Uh, if you don't, you're in a world of hurt when it comes to analyzing the performance of your model uh, and understanding the performance of your system. So I've also introduced a little loop at the bottom there uh, representing hyperparameter tuning. Especially once you've found a model that you like, you might want to perfect it with the perfect type of parameters, and that might involve an extra set of loops during your training and evaluation. To illustrate what this might look like in an ML system, uh, our model might take user listening information and our knowledge of artists, 
to create something that we call at Spotify artist affinity. Uh, how much we would expect a user to like and potentially listen to an artist. We could use that artist affinity score to personalize the rankings of different artists that we show on the homepage or in a playlist or all over the place, for example. Okay, so here we have a machine learning up and running, but our job doesn't end there. We have even more loops that I'll call the evaluation loop. You might start off with a model that optimizes, for example, suggested tracks, plays for suggested tracks, but after a while you realize the more powerful way to, to measure the impact of recommendations is not by plays, but it's about artist saves or the ads to playlists. Based off your learning, you might look for different features, different model architectures, et cetera, to maximize your performance. So going back into those previous loops. In recommendation systems at Spotify, offline testing is always much faster than online testing. Uh, and what I mean by online testing, what I mean is usually running an A-B test or some sort of experimentation framework. Um, now those tests could take weeks to get meaningful feedback uh, to get enough exposure. So, in so what we try to do is we try to come up with metrics that correlate the offline performance with the online performance so that we can actually those quicker offline evaluation loops uh, based off of our local metric and then hopefully once we have something that we really like, that we really believe is gonna move the metrics online, we can set up one of those online uh, A-B tests uh, and hopefully move the product in the way that we would hope. Now you can get pretty far with recommend recommendation systems with just those loops. Those slides weren't exhaustive, but they hit the major cycles that come up when I talk to machine learning engineers and machine learning practitioners. Two other loops that I'm gonna talk about are what I'd consider more advanced loops in the cycle, but also way more powerful. The first is what is easiest to understand as the models as features, and it's exactly what it sounds like. The output of a model is actually the input of another model. You have two systems intersecting. Now this is super powerful because you can get some really advanced features as inputs that you wouldn't necessarily have just from observing the data and the instrumentation. Uh, but it can also get very complex. At Spotify, we have entire teams that build out these models as features, uh, and they're de uh, dedicated to, uh, uh, to improving the consumption of their model. Quite often, we see that the best of our models today transition to the, the models that are used as features for future models. So that was true of the original vectors that we came up when we did all the um, matrix factorization uh, stuff in our early Discover products. Uh, it's been true of the embeddings that we've done when we did like word to vec with Discover Weekly uh, and so many other different models. Another advanced loop is one that I've come to know as the continuous training and development loop. Essentially, instead of training models one off or even on scheduled jobs, you immediately start training a new model once your last one has been deployed. Now this can be incredibly useful if the distribution of your data is constantly changing and shifting throughout the day, and having a fresh model on hand is pretty important. Now I'll be honest, we actually don't do a lot of, this, a lot of these uh, at Spotify. There's a few factors in that. One factor is that the cost implications are usually higher, just retraining a model. Um, the second one is that uh, the complexity of this, doing this uh, infrastructure setup, we need teams to be pretty advanced and polished in their practices. The third one is actually kind of on me and my team, is that our ML observability capabilities aren't quite where we need to have them, uh, to really understand how fast data distribution is shifting and if we need to deploy models on an hourly basis or more frequently than that. So I do see us moving to, uh, towards this paradigm as we advance those capabilities and build up our machine learning observability capabilities. And I think we could actually save money if we get to a place where we really understand what the model data distribution lift, uh, drift looks like uh, and we can see how often we need to, to redeploy a model. And sometimes that might not be, uh, except every few weeks. So those are the loops I wanted to talk about today. They form the basis of our personalization improvement. Um, many iterations through the loops make better recommendations and hopefully a better product and that makes our Chief Product Officer over there, Gustav, super, super happy and jamming to his Spotify product. So that's like a super old gift that I like to use in a lot of my slides. It's kind of an inside joke that, yeah, okay. So the various loops, building out a machine learning system, 
Now I'm finally gonna get to an area that's actually my expertise, how we built infrastructure at Spotify to support those loops and why it's important. Now I lead the group that we've just renamed to Hendrix. Uh, more about like, what, I, what that signifies uh, in a future series of blog posts or talks. Uh, but for now, you can just think of it as the machine learning platform team. So this is our mission statement. Um, I like what it means, but I'm not super thrilled about the length. And I was thinking that maybe after this talk, I'd simplify it a bit uh, to just we make you loop faster, because that's kind of the point. Uh, we make loop, you loop faster, build out your machine learning faster, get you need to, to where you need to go with tooling. We also do some stuff on governance, but that's, that's another uh, talk. So our platform is a series of products. Uh, for now, they're fairly distinct, but we're on a mission to make them uh, blend together more. Uh, no need to read all this. I'll get to these products one by one for now. So remember the problem understanding loop? One of the things I first saw when I started my focus on machine learning infrastructure was that folks were doing a pretty poor job here at Spotify. We saw teams try ML for a few sprints, um, and, but pick a problem that wasn't a machine learning problem uh, or something that they didn't have data for and they couldn't create a model. So we created a capability that we call our machine learning engagement team. Uh, their job is to partner with teams that are starting out their machine learning experience and either get them on a path to success, ideally using our machine learning infrastructure tools, or speed them up to, to failure. Now, that's a weird thing to say, saying I want people to, to move to failure, um, but I'd much rather have someone spend a few days uh, working with my team to get to a place where they know it's not a machine learning problem or they don't have data than, than weeks on their own uh, wasting their time. So do you remember when I talked about starting with a simple model to first set up your machine learning infrastructure skeleton and start collecting data? Uh, we built the tool that helps out, helps, that, helps teams with that. It abstracts the model portion away from the service so that we can independently loop on the data, the model, et cetera, without affecting the service code. Uh, this may seem like a small thing, but when we're able to separate those concerns, it allows a service owner, who's usually a back-end engineer and doesn't know machine learning, um, and the ML engineer to move faster autonomously. Um, and we're super big on autonomous, uh, being autonomous at Spotify. The worst thing in the world you can do is to block someone. So the tool that we built for this is called Salem. I know it's a pretty crude drawing over there. Um, it helps out with the deployment of models, logging, and features, the validation of the models, and the serving architecture, et cetera. It has close integration with our feature storage tooling, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, so that if you train a new model with a new set of features, you won't get a mismatch in the features of the models uh, when you deploy something new. It has also tight integrations with our experimentation framework so that when you uh, have a model that's associated with uh, experimentation, A-B test, uh, you get all that information fed back to you and you have, uh, it's easier to an analyze. And maybe more usefully, it helps our machine learning practitioners ex scale their model out to these 200 million, uh, million users in those 200 million territories. So it's a really, really piece of cool. So for the feature selection loop, we have a product that standardizes the way you read and you write features. It standardizes the way that you manipulate them using transformation and the way that you discover new features or you share your features with different teams to use. And we call that tool Jukebox. Jukebox offers a number of basic helper functions for dealing with features, including dealing with feature prep, joining, reading, storing to common stores. It also adds some more advanced features, store functionality, like the ability to register and discover features. With tight integrations with Salem, uh, it helps you out when you're performing these loops and introducing new features on our models. It also helps out with feature reuse. So if you've registered a feature using our uh, Jukebox system, we make it easier for someone else to use that in their machine learning system that might, they might just be starting off with. So Jukebox not only saves you manual toil when spinning up new feature infrastructure, but it also enables you to make other teams' development loops shorter. After all, there's no shorter loop than the one that you don't have to take. And if you're reusing a feature that's already known good and it's associated with production, you can skip one of the most, more, most difficult, time-consuming points of feature uh, engineering, um, and you're, you're off faster. So next, we step to our model training loop. Now there's a lot of moving parts here. 
Data pipelines intersect with model frameworks. We might need to train or evaluate using specialty hardware, such as GPUs or TPUs. We might need to use different libraries for different model algorithms. And to help containerize some of the moving parts, invest in a tool that we call Kubeflow, or that is called Kubeflow. And as you might guess, it's Kubernetes based and deals with the model training aspects. Now we can use it to chain together model training and batch inter uh, inter inference steps uh, producing a new data, a data set from a newly trained model. We also use TensorFlow Extended in, uh, within the context of Kubeflow. TFX is built for scalable production pipelines and has many libraries that help our teams build resilient ML systems. Now, one thing I should mention is these two last tools, Kubeflow and TFX, are open source or produced by Google um, in the case of TFX. Um, the, the other ones I was talking about, Jukebox and Salem, are stuff that's sort of internal to Spotify. So you can actually use TFX and, and uh, Qflow yourself. So finally, for the overall iteration loop, we have all these tools that we've mentioned before, plus a few helper systems. The first tool that we provide is a tool called ML Home. It's a centralized view of machine learning that's going on in Spotify, but also a zoomed in view to a team's ML project. It helps them understand how models perform over the time, how their models uh, perform against different metrics, um, it allows you to slice and dice different metrics to understand the nuance within the model. I like to call this tool the face of our machine learning platform because it also provides UI's elements to other uh, products that I've talked about. So we pair ML Home up with our metadata service. I think it's the unsung hero in our platform. Uh, not only does it allow us to link together various components in the ML lifecycle, it also connects with the metadata ontology of our backend and our data systems. Now, one of the questions I often get when I do talks about our machine learning infrastructure Spotify is why we built so many of these tools when there are products out there that do offer very similar capabilities. Uh, my first answer is that when we started to build these tools out, uh, those products just didn't exist in the marketplace. So there really was no alternative. The second uh, uh, answer that I give is that the tight integrations that we create between our backend services, our data services, and all that actually provides us substantial leverage and gives us an advantage that those third-party products just don't have. OK, OK. So I'm done talking about Spotify's infrastructure. Why is that all important, right? Uh, here's another way to view the ML lifecycle, these four stages of a system development that form another loop. Uh, we regularly survey our internal ML Spotify practitioners about their usage and their progress with machine learning. And early on, we saw some pretty concerning things, like that teams are spending one to three sprints, which are usually around two weeks, just getting an initial model prototype out. Now, that's a concern for impatient teams. Which PM wants to wait over a month uh, to see some initial results? It's worse when it comes to productionizing of ML systems. As you see in the highlight here, um, what we saw early on is that over 30% of ML practitioners we surveyed spent over a quarter uh, turning their idea into productionized software. Now, think about that. It's, it's more than a quarter to ship out something that you've already validated and believe that's worthwhile to ship to production. That's pretty nuts. And if you learned one thing so far during my talk, is that what really goes on in that ML lifecycle loop is a series of all these different subloops. And chained together, those subloops add up to the time that it actually takes to build out those machine learning systems. And in our last survey, or in one of the surveys that we ran, uh, we saw some teams spending up to 14 weeks uh, productionizing their tool. Now that progress was just a sum of all those little subloops. So if we can introduce these Hendrix tools and make, them, uh, make the teams move faster, whether by enabling them to reuse existing features, reuse components in ML system, uh, or rely on Salem for the model deployment and scaling, uh, we can drastically speed up those inner loops and affect the entire project pace. It's really all about the loops. So that's what we do with Hendrix. We make people loop faster through the ML process. We make them more productive and aid them to be, uh, build more maintainable systems. And hopefully, if we do jo our do jobs right and we hire great people, that will result in better recommendations for you uh, across the Spotify product. So thanks for your time today. I hope you learned a little bit about Spotify's personalization journey and how we started off with a simple interface, just collecting information that we use as a basis for future product innovation. 
Uh, those product innovations were the results of these many learning loops in the recommendation systems, as I described in the second section. Originally, all those loops were unaided or minimally aided by infrastructure, so it took a long time to resolve in a shippable product, uh, and that's why we invested in infrastructure, which I talked about in that third section. And this infrastructure has come far, but still we have a ways to go to make our ML partners even more efficient in their jobs. Now, if any of this sounds interested to you, I'm obligated to say that we're hiring. Uh, just ping me afterwards or check out our jobs site for details. Now, that's all the time I have today. It looks like um, I have about eight minutes for questions, uh, four minutes for questions. Uh, thanks for your time. So the question was, does our ML actually listen to songs? So we have quite a lot of teams. Uh, they're mostly research-based that do, do a lot of analysis on the songs. If you've ever used the playlist Release Radar, um, Release Radar is kind of like Discover Weekly, but it's all new songs. Uh, it actually used quite a bit to analyze some basic understanding of some, um, some yeah, like attributes of the song. I can't even remember what they are, but there's like bounciness, liveliness, I don't know, there are all sorts of different metrics. So we use that to feed some of the, uh, the, that pipeline. We actually also use some of the audio information itself to disambiguate artists, um, which is another really interesting topic. The metadata that we get from labels is usually pretty terrible, so we can't necessarily tell if you know, this one, I think the example that we use often is Rome. Like if this Rome is you know, a rapper or some like synth artist in, in London, uh, so by listening to the audio a little bit, um, we can fig that, figure out that. Uh, uh, the question was, do we ever encounter artists that submit uh, music to, that caters to the algorithms? Um, that's probably a little bit outside of my expertise. I would say we probably do. I mean, I know like a lot of people listen to sleep music or ambient music, and there's a lot of people that target that. Um, there's a, definitely a lot of people that target our search algorithm. Um, I think there's like this one guy that has a happy birthday song for like a thousand different names. You know, so there's definitely people, and if I was smarter early on in my journey, I would have done that stuff. Like named album or named artist like punk rock because we didn't have genre search uh, early on. And so like people with these very generic names were getting a lot of plays. Uh, so yes, um, two minutes more, I'll take one in the back. How much of the playlist for a machine learning model, input a machine learning model? Uh, so in some cases, it's pretty significant. Uh, so in a lot of Discover Weekly, I think there are a lot of other talks about it. Uh, playlist really powered a lot of our initial Discover Weekly phases. Um, but we're constantly launching in new markets, and we realized that when we were launching those new markets, people were having a pretty poor Discover Weekly experience. Uh, I remember, for example, in Brazil, which, I don't know, we launched in 2017 or 18. Um, Discover Weeklies were terrible because it was mostly Western, sort of American, European music that we were recommending. Uh, we found over time that we needed to change that uh, as we launched new markets and come up with different algorithms that would uh, see a better personalized experience. Yeah, so the question was about our engagement team and how often we find a, a problem that's not solvable from ML. Uh, I'd say that it's re getting reduced over time um, as we have more sort of centers of gravity around machine learning locally in different offices. I'll just tell a quick story. So when we first started out this team, offices are, were split pretty much between Stockholm and New York and Boston to some degree. Um, and most of our machine learning was happening in New York and Boston. Uh, and the Stockholm teams were, were just kind of experimenting. I remember talking to someone that wanted to play around with a left-handed layout because he thought machine learning is magic and that you know, just using machine learning we could create this left-handed layout determining people were left-handed and, and come up with something great. Uh, after a while of talking to him uh, and trying to understand more about this problem, we realized that they had never validated that anybody even wanted a, a left-handed layout or like that, that was something useful to do in the product. Uh, so we offered them to first create a button that people could select to do that, and if they validated it, then maybe then we could use machine learning that would come up with an actual prediction if someone is left-handed or not. So we had probably a lot of those sorts of things early on, um, but yeah, there was this big idea, especially in like 2018 and 2019 with the hype cycle was crazy, that machine learning was magic, and they could just throw these problems that they couldn't figure out, you know, machine learning at it would be successful. So yeah, that's, uh, I want to leave plenty of time for the next speaker to set up. Uh, thanks for your time, and I could probably go out in the hallway if you have more questions. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>